Well, good morning, class, and welcome to our adult class on Sunday morning. This is our very first Bible class since the pandemic has occurred in the church building. I've been teaching online uh, every Wednesday night, um, and so I welcome those of you who are listening online as well. And I want you to know that, um, that we've been looking at the 51st Psalm. It's a psalm of contrition, a psalm of renewal. And so I thought, hmm, because the elders have decided that we'll not have the Wednesday um, service, the Bible class that's put online, we'll just use this in its place. So I've encouraged um, uh, those listening on Wednesday to tune in on Sunday. And uh, I guess my question is, I don't want to start over with the very first verse of Psalms 51. Uh, I, will, I will give a brief summary but just out of curiosity, without putting anyone on the spot, of those who, who are here, um, how many have been following the Wednesday night class on Psalm 51? So my guess is that's about half, maybe less than half. So uh, with that in mind, I think we will have a, uh, a summary, but not an extended summary. I'm not going to reteach the classes. The other... Uh, caveat that I need to share is that normally when we have met, the classes I've taught, we've always met in the fellowship room in home improvement. It's called the home improvement class. And it's small enough that we could have some discussion. But now we're in the sanctuary. We're in the auditorium and we're spread out uh, and you're all masked. So it's going to really sort of turn into a lecture. Uh, that's not too uncommon for me anyway. But nonetheless, if you have a question during, during the class, if you just want to raise your hand and stand up, I'll hear you, and I'll just repeat it to, to the online listeners, and then we'll take it from there. We'll see how this goes, okay? Let's open with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give you the glory during this pandemic. As Shane said, during the communion, you are on the throne. And so therefore, Lord, we want you on our on the throne of our hearts. And Psalm 51, Father, is the perfect uh, reminder that you indeed are on the throne and that we need to fall before you and ask for mercy and grace in these times of need. And so we thank you, Lord, for your presence within us and all around us. We ask your blessing on this class, on the congregation here at Antioch and all of your people all over the world, and we ask that you will bless our country. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, I think it would be a good idea to simply read the psalm. Uh, this, is, this will go on. We'll do this for several weeks. Not read the psalm, but I mean, but we're, it has 19 verses. If you, if you don't have your Bibles with you, but you've got your phones, feel free to open up the Bible or just listen attentively as I read. And I'm going to read all 19. I know it'll take us about four or five minutes at the most. But listen to the word of the Lord. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy steadfast love, according to thy abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done that which is evil in thy sight, so that thou art justified in thy sentence, and blameless in thy judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in, in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean." Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Fill me with joy and gladness. Let the bones which thou hast broken rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, 
and sinners will return to thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of thy deliverance. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall, shall show forth thy praise. For thou hast no delight in sacrifices. By the way, class, this is the key verse. For thou hast no delight in sacrifices. Were I to give a burnt offering, thou wouldst not be pleased. Here it is. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good to Zion in thy good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then wilt thou delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls be offered on thy altar. Church, it really is a psalm of contrition. It's a psalm of renewal. Um, it's a prayer for renewal. And I can tell you that when it comes to being renewed, we're all there. I know as I look around to many of the faces that I'm so familiar with, and sometimes I wonder, my goodness, you are just like nearly perfect. So I wonder what the Lord can give word for someone who really walks in the light. And the truth is, it's no different from what I shared this morning during the message. We all need renewing from time to time. There are moments when we know, I know, when I have done that which is not pleasing to God. In the course of my life, some of those moments I think were heinous, were really bad. Other moments, I would think, well, that's not so bad. But in fact, one's whole life is a journey. It's a journey of faith. We want to journey in the light. Does that mean that we always are in the light? Well, the answer is no, we're not. Romans 3.23, all men have sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. It means that when we tempted and yielding to that temptation, like David, when we veer off into the shade and the fog and maybe even the darkness that God is calling us back all the time and that if we confess our sins one to the other that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, this is an outline that um, I'm not going to go through it. You can read it for yourself. Um, but there are... Um, about seven parts. We've already talked about the cry for cleansing, verses 1 and 2, and the reality of sin, verses 3 and 4, the depths of sin, 5 and 6, and today we're, we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 9. But first, let me give us that, that summary that I talked about. Um, we don't have to be introduced to King David. We know who David is, was. We also know that David... Uh, was considered a man after God's own heart. And I find that um, really, I find that reassuring for me because if David is a guy after God's own heart, then maybe wit can also be there. Maybe at times I can do that as well. Maybe God considers me a man after his own heart. I say that because we're not looking at perfection. If that's the case, I'm not a man after God's own heart. So what had David done? Well, we all know about his lusting after Bathsheba, uh, the sin of adultery, the sin of betrayal to one of his mighty men, Uriah, who happened to be Bathsheba's husband, and then eventually murdering um, Uriah the Hittite. So if you want to read about it, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, that must be an alert. Yeah. Are we all right? That's all right. This doesn't bother me. I just, folks online may not know what we're listening to. All these telephones are going off. You know what? Here's an aside. This reminds me when I was in the military and I would be having a, 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 a chaplain service, you know, would have a worship service and I'd have all the commanders and the troops, and, um, and, all, and we, this was even before we had cell phones, but we all had what we called bricks. 
we had actual bricks. They would hang on. They were, they were walkie-talkies. And sometimes during a message, all the walkie-talkies would go off. And, from, and I learned from that moment forward, the worship is over. I would just say, go in peace, amen. And everybody would jump up and leave because they were all on call. There was an alert going on. You know, I've been on B-52 bases, and when things like that happen, then you know it's really serious, and all, all the fighter wings and so forth. So this is not quite the same. But if you all jump up and leave, I don't have a phone, but I'm following. Second <laughs> right. Samuel chapter 11 records David's sin with Bathsheba. He sees her. He's on his rooftop of his palace. He sees her bathing on the rooftop of, of her house. And uh, he lusts, the lust led into adultery and then pregnancy and then David wanting to cover his sin. So he simply had Uriah come home. That didn't work. So then he sent Uriah to the front line and he told the commander in chief, uh, uh, Joab, to put him on the front line and to um, let him die. And Nathan... This is in 2 Samuel 12. Nathan, by order of the Spirit of God, goes to David. And, and apparently David, uh, Nathan did this quite often. And so he shared a parable. It's, it's, it's really one of the most meaningful parables in all of Scripture, where, da- where Nathan shares the parable about there was a rich man with many flocks, a poor man with one little ewe lamb as a pet. A visitor came. The rich man didn't take one of his own sheep, or, or, or cows, he went to the poor man and took his pet lamb, butchered it, and fed it to his guest. And David interrupted Nathan and said, that man deserves to die. And Nathan says, of course, you are the man. Does exactly what a parable is supposed to do. A parable is supposed to bring, the, the story is there just for color. The parable has one moral, one point. All of the parabolic teachings of Christ, each one of them had one point. You don't have to understand the everything going on to get the one point. We, I've never had a flock of sheep or a bunch of cows, herd of cows. And some of you may have. But, you know, we might be foreign to the rich man and the poor man, but we clearly know what, David, what Nathan was talking about. You are the man. Now, the moment that David realized his sin, I mean, he knew he had sinned before because that's in Psalm 32. He just hadn't quickly, he hadn't dealt with him. And Nathan, so we're not talking about day, day, day here. We're probably talking about months at a time. It probably, well, even the, even the birth process took nine months. So we're talking, he sees Bathsheba, he sins, uh, she's pregnant, he brings Uriah back, sends him back, has him killed, and then all the way up, you know, for several months, Psalm 32 tells us that, and then David is finally confronted by Nathan, and Nathan confronts David, and David then apparently pins this psalm of renewal. The first thing that we do when we need to be rededicated is we need to be cleansed. If there's no crying for cleansing, this is when repentance really takes its, comes to the forefront. I've had people ask me, uh, why, you know, is my, is, you know, why do I, you know, why am I suffering from this sin, you know, over and over and over again? I do believe our sin is ever before us, even when it's forgiven. But it may also be that you've never cried for cleansing. There is a cry for cleansing. Have mercy on me, O God. He's doing this in front of the altar. Now notice the verbs, blot, wash, and cleanse. It's a cry for cleansing. We have to realize that we've sinned. We're not going to cry for cleansing unless we realize we've sinned. I know my transgressions, um, and my sin is ever before me. I want to spend more time on this, but that wouldn't be fair to those who have been attending. Um, there's a depth of sin. We talked about, not the original sin, we talked about do we suffer from the consequence of uh, the guilt of Adam's sin or do we suffer from the consequence of Adam's sin, which was death? I know that Christendom is divided, meaning there are those who believe that an infant from the womb is already suffering from the guilt 
of Adam's sin. I really have a hard time finding that in Scripture. I do believe the infant and all of us suffer from the consequence. Paul writes in Romans 5, 12, through one man sin entered the world and death through sin so that all men die because all men sin. The, the, the consequence of, of Adam and Eve's sin and therefore the consequence of my sin. I die because I sin, but an infant really does have the nature, the consequence, I believe, of Adam's sin. And I think that's precisely what um, David's talking about. Now we come to the fourth step to um, cleansing and communion, and that's where we are today. So this is what the text says. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin, and blot out all my iniquities. Now, we're going to talk about hyssop. I'll go ahead and make it up. Purge, we all know what the word purge means, to clean, um, Actually, I, I didn't know a whole lot about hyssop until I began studying in detail this psalm, um, not just recently, but some time ago. Uh, but hyssop was a medicinal plant. I've always believed, and I still believe it was used, that whenever our Lord was on the cross, that attached to, the, to a long pole of sorts was the hyssop that had been soaked in wine and put on his lips to drink. Now, some say that was a gesture of of uh, fondness and a gesture of compassion. He didn't drink it, but some say that it was. But we do know that hyssop was medicinal. Uh, they, they say, the experts have said, that hyssop, which grows in Egypt and throughout the Middle East, uh, maybe even here, I'm, I'm certainly no horticulturist, I don't know, but that hyssop was used as an antiseptic. So it, anyway, the, the point is David knew that. That's my point. Since he knew that, He's now praying, Father, God, purge me, you know, make me clean as we do with hyssop on others when they're ill. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken uh, may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, blot out my iniquities. We're going to talk about everything underlined. Um, I... I know that we just, one of the lessons I take from these three verses, seven, eight, and nine, is keep on keeping on. Um, I know some of you have been praying the same prayer for years. I know because I've talked with many of you, and I have too, by the way. I have one or two prayers that I've uttered for at least 20 years. Well, you know, dealing with my own family, my children, health, spiritual walk, etc. cetera. Um, I think it's very, not only is it, is it not unusual, it should not be unusual. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7 and 8, he says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. And to him who seeks, he shall find. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. But the predicate is we have to ask and seek and knock. And we know he's not making reference to one asking, one seeking, and one knocking. I mean, I've had my mother share with me before she died in 2002. There were prayers that she's uttered her whole life for me or my brother, one of my brothers that she named in particular. Yeah. Ask, seek, and knock. I'd love to ask questions right now, but I guess it's just not going to work. Um, we have two choices, as I see it. David had two choices. We can either despair. Nathan comes to David. He lays out his sin, and David just despairs, and he just wastes away. Or we can pray. And that's what he does. This is a prayer. It's a prayer for a renewal. Have mercy on me, O oh God. Have mercy on me. You know, cleanse me from my sins. Wash me from my iniquities. Blot out all of my transgressions. Purge me with hyssop. The first nine verses are a plea for, to God to forgive us. Notice the verbs. Blot, wash, 
cleanse, purge, wash, and hide. Don't look at the dark side of the Lord. In fact, the Lord has told David, I won't look at the dark side. I will make you white as snow. I mean, this is what he says. You know, I will wash you. Um, unsend me. Purge. Do we use the word purge? Have you ever, uh, I mean, is that in your vernacular? Do you use purge? I don't. But, I'm, but, but go ahead. If, if you've, you know, I know you know what it means. I'm just curious. Um, we purge. Describes the cleansing of a leper. By the way, I put these notes up for me as well. Um, the word purge in Hebrew, I'm not sure about the Greek because I didn't look into it, but I know in Hebrew, it's, it's the word they use when the, um, when the priests had to go into a leper's house and begin to clean it. You know, there was, there was a ceremonial cleansing. It was a ceremonial purging of the house. Same word that the priest would use in a leper's house to cleanse it, that David draws on to purge his own house, his own body. Purge me with hyssop. I've already talked about the, um, the medicinal herb, uh, herb. You say herb or herb? Yeah. Do I either say herb or you're wrong? No, you're not. It's both, I don't have a clue. I guess both pronunciations are good. You know, I'm trying to, we're, we're, you know, I'm used to a smaller class. Forgive me for this. Aside. Okay, wash me whiter than snow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. I want you to know that this Psalm 8 is uh, one of the top 10 for me. You know, I don't know exactly where it would fit, but if you were to ask me my 10 favorite passages, that would be included. And once you read it, and once you've heard me preach and teach, and you know my life, you know me, and I think I'm a good man in the eyes of the world, and I think I'm a sinful man in the eyes of, of, of perfection, and really, that both are true, I think. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. I love reading this. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, he does not deal with us according to our sins. Thank goodness. I don't have good hearing, but I caught that, bud. Thank goodness, bud said. Yeah, this is the mulligan I'm talking about. Um, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, he does not deal with us according to our sins. For, uh, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love. This is my favorite line. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Notice it doesn't say north to south. You can judge north and south. We have the Arctic and the Antarctic. We have the North Pole and the South Pole. We have the equator. The moment you cross, you're in the south, down under. The moment above it, you're in the north when it comes to the world's geography. Try that with east and west. The rising of the sun, setting of the sun. It's impossible. Now, I don't think David, inspired by the Spirit, by the way, David wrote this psalm. Psalm 108, David wrote. He wrote about 75 of the 150, but this is one of them, along with 32 and 51. So you think David, and this, is, this follows the moment with Bathsheba and the forgiveness from Do you think he was mindful of that when he penned the 108th Psalm? Absolutely. Absolutely he was. He's, it's a song of praise. And he's saying, God, and God's telling him these words. I believe that. I believe it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So God himself says, as far as the east is from the west, I have removed your transgressions, your sins. Beautiful memory to have when you read this. Okay, the prayer for restoration. This is the latter part. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. I don't know about you, but sin does crush, does it not? And it breaks. Small sins, big sins, however we classify them, 
You tell a white lie, you think about it. Why do you think about it? Well, because you know that it was wrong. It's, you know, you can take the truth, you can embellish it, and you can sort of hint that what you said is right because, you know, you can, because of the intention. But God knows. By the way, a lie is defined. Uh, this is how I define a lie. A lie is defined when it is wanting to deceive someone intentionally. Because there are those who say the truthful words, but they do it in such an have such an ulterior motive that indeed they also would be lying. Um, restoration demands cleansing and communion. Does anybody have a thought that they would like to share? And you can speak it out loud and I can repeat it on, on any of these. Yes, um, Andrew. Say that again, the, for just the first part. Thank you for taking the mask off. Yeah, what, what Andrew said is there are two ways we can address sin, and Paul addresses both ways repeatedly. And I think David does too here in the psalm. One way is to simply um, say it's no big deal, you know, and the other is to, um, is to pray for forgiveness. Is that what I'm getting from you? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I agree. Now, th that's exactly what, we were trying to, what I was trying to communicate right here when I said despair or pray. That was quite a way. You know, you can despair about it and then just let it go, or you can actually pray about it. It's very important to understand those, that distinction. Okay, are there any other thoughts? Because I think we're kind of wrap it up there. But keep in mind, if this is the takeaway for, for today, the 51st Psalm provide steps to renewal. Whatever word you want. We've often, years ago, we would ask for people to come forward in the, in the sermon, would offer the invitation, and the invitation would be something like, if you want to obey the gospel, come down. If you you want to uh, place membership with this local church family, you're welcome to come. If you want to rededicate yourself and ask for the prayers of the church, walk on down the aisle. All three are still all the time moving, I pray, in the Antioch church family on Sunday as well, even though they may not be expressed precisely like that. We need rededication. Rededication is nice to come and pray with the shepherds. It's nice to pray with each other, confess your sins one to the other, right? But you there is no shortcut that when it comes to rededicating your life, you have to go to God. And to go to God, there is a cry for cleansing, reality of sin. You need to understand how deep the sin is. And then you need to ask God to not only cleanse you, but for restoration, for communion. By the way, and I'll not back it up, th these three verses I've entitled Cleansing and Communion. The word communion is important. You will never relate to God or each other, neither will I, unless we are cleansed. There is no fellowship, no partnership, no communion. I'm convinced that's why Jesus talked about when you take your gift to the altar, but you have a grievance against a brother, leave your gift. Don't offer it just, just yet. First go be reconciled with your brother, then offer the gift. Now you can take that in a, in a spiritual way too. When we break bread on Sunday, it is a communal act. So sin is not isolated. Sin always involves others. And repentance needs to involve others. Confession needs to involve others. And God, cleanse and then have communion. Any closing thoughts? Again, I know it's challenging with the mask. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. And uh, next Sunday, we'll be looking at the fifth step, which is a clean heart. David's talked about crying to God, and now he'll pick up how we are cleansed.
and it begins with the heart. Father God, we do give you this message, your word. We ask that you'll help us understand it, that you'll help us apply it in, in everything that we do. Thank you so much, Father, for loving us, and thank you for bringing us together as your people in the midst of this pandemic. We do ask that you will heal our land, that we might all be able to physically uh, congregate again. In the name of Christ, we thank you. Amen. I think we're